The brain receives blood from the anterior cerebral artery, the middle cerebral artery, and posterior cerebral artery. It is very important to know how these three main arteries supply regions of the cortex. For example, a patient comes into your office and is diagnosed with a stroke. Upon your physical examination, you note that there are serious motor and sensory deficits in his right leg. The results of an MRI show a cortical lesion. Which blood vessel is likely affected by the stroke? So the answer here would be the anterior cerebral artery, or ACA. Now the fact that the question lets you know it's a cortical lesion means that you should be thinking about these three major cortical blood suppliers. The key is that there are motor deficits in his right leg. Now, if you look at the homunculus, it becomes clear that the area of the motor and somatosensory cortex responsible for the lower extremities lies in the region supplied by the ACA. Now, this type of question is a favorite with board examiners. It could have been more complicated had you not known that the site of the lesion was in the cortex. So make sure you study the map of the homunculus and so you have an idea in your head where the representation of different body parts are in terms of the cortical blood suppliers. Okay, now I want to take a few minutes to discuss the circle of Willis in a little bit more detail. This looks much more complex than it actually is, so let's break it down so you can understand how the anterior and posterior circulations anastomose. So coming up, the spinal cord, we have these vertebral arteries, which will give rise to the basilar artery. Now off the basilar artery, we have the anterior inferior cerebellar artery, we have the superior cerebellar artery, and then we have the posterior cerebral artery. Now at the same time, we have the internal carotid artery, and that gives rise to the MCA, or middle cerebral artery, as well as anterior cerebral artery. And then we have a couple anastomoses here. Connecting the MCA to the PCA is the posterior communicating artery and connecting both ACAs is the anterior communicating artery. And when you look at this, you see this circle that's formed, and that is the circle of Willis. Now, in the middle of the circle of Willis is what structure? That structure is the optic chiasm. Cranial nerve 3 is also in very close proximity to the PCA. Therefore, you can have a third nerve palsy by virtue of mass effect. Now that we've discussed that, let's continue to look at how the major blood vessels supply oxygen to the brain. The ACA, anterior cerebral artery, provides blood supply to the medial surface of the brain. You can see an example of that here. The MCA supplies the lateral zones of the brain and it is split into superior and inferior divisions. The PCA provides blood to the posterior and inferior parts of the brain. Now, there are watershed zones, and these are the areas that are most susceptible to hypoperfusion, and they occur between the ACA and MCA, and then again between the MCA and the PCA. The ACA-MCA junction mediates the proximal arm and leg areas of the motor homunculus. You should remember that. Thus, an infarct here produces a man-in-the-barrel syndrome, where these patients are unable to walk because their arms dangle and their hips are weak. The ACA-MCA junction mediates the proximal arm and leg area of the motor homunculus. That's something you should remember from earlier in these lectures. So an infarct here produces a man-in-the-barrel syndrome. Man-in-the-barrel syndrome basically is where these patients are able to walk, but their arms dangle and their hips are weak. The MCA-PCA junction mediates the occipital lobe, which we have an example of here. Thus, infarcts here can produce visual agnosias and cortical blindness. Visual agnosia refers to the brain's inability to recognize common objects, even though the visual stimulus is normally received. Right, so the eyes don't have a problem. You're able to actually get the information to your brain. However, your brain then has problems identifying what is happening. A very specific agnosia that you may encounter in popular media or perhaps on a question is prosopagnosia. This is the inability to recognize faces and the famous neurologist Oliver Sacks actually suffers from this. 
This is the guy who wrote that book, The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat. All right, everybody, time for a flash quiz. I don't know why, every time I see this, I just keep thinking flash mob, but obviously that can't happen. Okay, what is the significance of watershed zones? Where do they occur in the cortical circulation? Watershed zones are those areas of the brain most susceptible to hypoperfusion, and they occur between the ACA and MCA, and then again between the MCA and the PCA. Okay, now let's talk about the effects of strokes in various regions of the brain. You've got a great table in the book that's organized by anatomical location. Each important vessel is listed on the left, with detail about the effects of a stroke listed there on the right. However, you should keep in mind that test questions will be much more likely to give you the symptoms, and then you will need to sort those into one or multiple anatomic regions, just like your patients will need you to do in the future. So let's start with the anterior circulation. The MCA, as we've discussed, supplies the lateral surface of the brain. So you should expect that the motor and sensory cortices will be affected, along with Wernicke and Broca's area. Now, this will give you contralateral paralysis, numbness in the upper limb and face, and possibly hemineglect. The ACA, right, anterior cerebral artery, is much more medial, and so you should see effects on the motor and sensory cortices that supply the lower limb. Last, on the anterior circulation, is the lateral striate artery. We haven't mentioned this one before, but actually it's really critical. The lateral striate is a smaller branch of the MCA. Importantly, it is a common location for lacunar strokes. Now, lacuna infarcts are infarcts that occur secondary to long-term hypertension. Because this vessel supplies a striatum, an internal capsule, you can have severe hemiparesis and hemiplegia. It is noteworthy that lacunar strokes can occur in other deep brain structures as well. And with most of the things we've discussed, where it occurs will determine the symptoms. Now we'll move on to the posterior circulation where we encounter the medial and lateral medullary syndromes. The medial medullary syndrome is caused by a lesion in the anterior spinal artery. This runs down medially and ventrally. Infarction of the ACA affects the corticospinal tracts before they decussate in the medullary pyramids. It also affects the medial lemniscus as it travels from the spinal cord to the thalamus. Lastly, it affects cranial nerve 12. So what are the symptoms you would expect with this type of lesion? Well, you would get a contralateral hemiparesis. You'd have impaired contralateral proprioception and an ipsilateral paralysis of the tongue. Now keep in mind that the tongue deviates to the side of the lesion. This can be extremely helpful when you're trying to localize the lesion to a particular hemisphere on a question. Strokes in the posterior inferior cerebellar artery, or pica, are known as either Wallenberg syndrome or lateral medullary syndrome. They are typically caused by a proximal vertebral artery occlusion. Now, many nuclei are affected, as you can see here. This includes the spinal thalamic tract, the spinal trigeminal nucleus, the nucleus solitarius and ambiguous of the vagal nerve, the descending sympathetic tracts, and the inferior cerebellar peduncle. Now, what would you expect if all of these different nuclei are lesioned? Well, you'd get a lot of things. So with the vestibular nuclei, you'd see vertigo, vomiting, nystagmus. With the spinal thalamic tract, we know that this is important for pain and temperature. Importantly, it will be on the contralateral side. On the spinal trigeminal nucleus, again, we know it's important for pain and temperature. However, this time it's on the face and it's ipsilateral. The nucleus solitarius is important for the gag reflex, so you'll have decreased gag reflex. While because of the sympathetic tract involvement, you will get Horner syndrome. With the cerebellar peduncle, we know that the cerebellum is important for motion and movement, and so ataxia makes sense. And lastly, the nucleus ambiguous, you would get hoarseness. This last clue, hoarseness, is actually something that you should really look out for because if you see that, you have a very good clue that you're probably dealing with Wallenberg syndrome or lateral medullary syndrome. The anterior inferior cerebellar artery, or ICA, right, A-I-C-A, also supplies many territories and strokes there cause many symptoms.
Here it is on the diagram. Areas affected include the vestibular nucleus, the spinothalamic tract, the dorsocochlear nucleus, cranial nerve 7 and 8, and the middle cerebellar peduncle, part of the cerebellar hemisphere. Here I'm just listing the main ones. So what symptoms would you expect from these lesions? So again, with the vestibular nerve and nucleus, you can expect this triad, vomiting, vertigo, and nystagmus. Cranial nerve 7, the facial nerve, you can expect facial paralysis, reduce salivation, lacrimation, and taste from the anterior two-thirds of the tongue, as well as an absent corneal reflex. This is actually kind of an important point because many times when we think of cranial nerve 7, we restrict it to its impact on the tongue and taste and its involvement in the face. But the corneal reflex is actually a very good test for the cranial nerve 7, and so you should try to remember that. Then with the spinothalamic tract, of course, this is important for pain and temperature, so we'll have those losses. And then with the middle cerebellar peduncle and cerebral hemisphere, again, we know the cerebellum's role in movement and coordinating movement, so we can expect ataxia. Again, with all of these, it's really just important to remember what is this region normally doing. And then if you figure out that there's a lesion there, you can just subtract that from normal function. And so lesion will lead to whatever that region normally does not functioning properly anymore. It's a pretty simple concept. For step one, the PCA is relatively simple. It goes to the occipital lobe, so you would have loss of vision, and that would happen on the contralateral side. Technically, it would be a hemianopsia, and importantly, you would have macular sparing. Lastly, a stroke in the basilar artery is very, very scary. You can tell this is a pretty important artery. It's pretty big. And this stroke leads to locked-in syndrome. It will take out the pons, the medulla, the lower midbrain, the cortical spinal tract, and the cortical bulbar tracts, as well as the PPRF. And that's a lot, and it's no wonder then that a lesion there leads to locked-in syndrome. And this name is precisely what it implies. The patient is unable to move. It's not a coma, however, because they retain consciousness and they can communicate through blinking. Now, why is it that blinking is spared when all of these other things are impaired? Well, it's because the upper part of the midbrain is important for blinking. That's where the nuclei that control ocular movements are. And so, obviously, that region is spared, and thus you have sparing of ocular movements. Lastly, we will briefly discuss the two communicating arteries, the anterior communicating artery and the posterior communicating artery. Now, it is less likely that you would get an ischemic stroke in these arteries. Now, why do you think that is? Well, the whole point of this circle of Willis is that it provides redundant circulation. So if part of this artery is blocked, you will still get circulation from the other side. And that's the whole point of having this system. So in this situation, you'll normally have berry aneurysms instead of ischemic strokes. In the anterior communicating artery, you will get visual defects. Whereas in the posterior communicating artery, you will get a third nerve palsy. Now, what is the common symptom of a third nerve palsy? Well, in this situation, you have an eye that goes down and out. Although, I don't know if you'd be smiling if he has a cranial nerve palsy, but whatever. All right, people, time for a flash quiz. Where are the effects of strokes of the MCA and the ACA felt? This leads us right back to our homunculus. An MCA would impair the face and upper limbs, while the ACA impairs the lower limbs. As we just mentioned, berry aneurysms are very common at the Circle of Willis. This is an example of a berry aneurysm here. About 30% of berry aneurysms occur at the anterior communicating artery, while 25% of them occur at the posterior communicating artery. Lastly, 20% occur at the middle cerebral artery. Berry aneurysms are prone to rupture, which can lead to subarachnoid hemorrhage. Risk factors for aneurysmal rupture include hypertension, smoking, advanced age, and people with adult polycystic kidney disease, ADPKD. There are also two connective tissue disorders that were discussed in biochemistry that lead to increased risk of developing aneurysms. 
I'll give you a second to think about it. The disorders are Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome and Marfan Syndrome. Both affect connective tissue, which is obviously an important part of the integrity of blood vessels. Charcot-Bouchard microaneurysms are another type of aneurysm occurring in the lenticulostriate arteries to the basal ganglia and thalamus. When these aneurysms rupture due to chronic hypertension, a hemorrhagic stroke ensues. When I was really young, my dad came home one day pretty distraught. A friend of his had a daughter who was out in the yard sweeping. She said, Dad, I have a really bad headache. Minutes later, she fell to the floor and she was dead before she even reached the hospital. Unknown to anyone, she had had a berry aneurysm that had ruptured. Now after that day, for a while, I was always scared that I had an aneurysm and that no one knew about it and that every headache might be my last. Kind of morbid, I know, but hopefully it'll help you remember something about these types of aneurysms that we'll come back to. So saccular, also known as berry aneurysms, are the most common type of aneurysm that one encounters on the wards. These aneurysms often go undetected unless they get big enough to compress a surrounding structure or if they rupture. In fact, it's estimated that one in every 50 people have a berry aneurysm, which is actually kind of scary odds. So let's talk about how these aneurysms can present in the clinic depending on where they occur. First, we'll talk about an aneurysm at the anterior communicating artery. An aneurysm here could compress the optic chiasm. And what would this lead to? So this would cause a bitemporal hemianopia. We'll talk about this in more detail when we reach the ophthalmology section. But thinking back to the homunculus, what part of the body would be affected by the ischemia that could be caused by an aneurysm in the anterior communicating artery? That would be the contralateral lower extremity which would be affected by both sensory as well as motor deficits. Another common place one would find an aneurysm is the posterior communicating artery. Now, an aneurysm here would lead to an ipsilateral cranial nerve 3 palsy. And we'll get into this in more detail later, but do you remember what the signs of a cranial nerve 3 palsy are? They are medriasis, ptosis, and a down and out eye. And like I said, we'll talk about that in more detail soon. So ischemia in the distribution of the PCA would also lead to a contralateral homonymous hemianopia with macular sparing. Lastly, let's talk about an aneurysm that causes ischemia in the MCA distribution. Again, let's try to remember the homunculus. Picture it in your mind. Okay, now here it is. It becomes clear that an aneurysm causing ischemia in this distribution would lead to sensory and motor deficits in the upper extremities as well as the face. Now, just for review, what is the most common complaint of a patient with a ruptured aneurysm? So remember my dad's friend's daughter's story? Moments before she died, she expressed how bad of a headache she had. With aneurysms, patients will often say that they are having the worst headache of my life. And this is not only a clue in clinical practice, but it's also a very useful cue on the boards. Central post-stroke pain syndrome is a common cause of central pain. It occurs due to thalamic lesions and usually results from a stroke in this region. It is a difficult syndrome to diagnose because there are other causes of pain that have to be ruled out, such as gout, arthritis, DVT, and musculoskeletal injury. Now, the pain that you get can be either spontaneous or it can be evoked. One way to look out for this on the test is to look for a patient who has had a stroke a few months earlier and is now complaining of pain on the contralateral side to the side where he initially had the stroke. This patient might also complain of sensory changes in the region that also has the pain.